one year ago I had a breast reduction. Here's my road to reduction. Welcome to episode 9, A New Awakening. In the last episode, we covered surgery morning. In this episode, I'm going to go over the first few days of recovery. And I'm going to break my recovery into a couple days at a time because, especially in the first two weeks, a couple days at a time means huge changes in what you're able to do. A couple days at a time is the difference between barely moving and able to be up and around. So I wanted to break it out piece by piece to give you my healing process, but I also want to put in the disclaimer before we get started that everyone heals differently. Some people heal really quickly, some people heal very slowly. Your healing experience is going to be personalized to you and may look nothing like mine. Maybe you have a quicker timeline, maybe a slower one. Whatever your body does is perfectly fine. You're going to heal at the pace that your body dictates. So the hardest part of healing is putting up with whatever pace that is. So when I left off in episode 8, I had talked about going into surgery, but we hadn't talked about coming out of surgery. And going into surgery was an extremely, extremely stressful spot for me. And we started surgery just before 7, and the events of the morning felt very chaotic going into it. When it comes time for waking up, I feel like it was a much slower pace. But I also want to put in a disclaimer, like, again, everyone is different, and I do not react well to waking up from being put to sleep. I do not react well at all to waking up from being put to sleep. It is very messy. And so that impacted my awakening from surgery. So I just want you to know that before I I jump into the details. So surgery started just before 7 and it ended at 9.40, which was actually earlier than what they had expected. They told my parents we'd probably be out by like 10 o'clock, 10.30 even. So it went very smoothly from their stance. It went very quickly. It didn't have any complications in the OR room. Thank goodness. The next part is is going to be like two sides to the coin. I'm going to say what I remember and then the events that everyone else told me. So what I remember is waking up vaguely around 10 a.m. because I could see the clock. It was right next to my bed and I was on the, my left side curled up in the fetal position and the only thought I had was this isn't right. I'm supposed to be on my back and then I passed out again. So apparently i had been in and out for a few moments and then to me I felt like I woke up again instantly and, and the nurse was there asking for my parents but that actually ended up being like 15, 20 minutes later. For me, I was, it was like, I thought once I woke up at 10, I was conscious the whole time, but I definitely wasn't. So at one point, I woke up, the nurse was there, she asked if I wanted my parents back there, I said yes. I don't remember holding that conversation, this is what the nurse and my parents told me. My parents came back, apparently had a few words with me, and then according to them, I fell asleep again, but I don't remember them showing up back in my little post-op area. I don't remember them coming in and and having a conversation with me. So I slept for a while. I remember waking up again and the nurse happened to walk in like right as I woke up and, and again I'm still on my left side in the fetal position and she asked how I was feeling and I told her that my chest was on fire and she said well what's your pain level and I said seven and then passed out. So I I want to say a few things about that seven. I don't really think it was a seven, especially because I could pass out like two seconds later. I don't think it was a seven, but also I'm someone who has a pretty decently high pain threshold. So what is a seven to anyone? You know, like that one through 10 scale, what really is that? I knew when I threw out a number that this was more pain than I'd been in since I could remember for a large chunk of time, not that I could remember <laughs> large chunks of time being as drugged out as I was, but um, this was extremely painful and extremely painful meant a higher number and seven popped into my head. So I said seven. 
I don't want to scare anyone about how you're going to wake up and you're going to be in so much pain. I think, you know, I think my nerve endings were truthfully what was giving that. It felt like my chest was on fire because there had been a lot of cutting and there had been a lot of removing and reshaping. And I think there was just so many different signals going on that my body didn't quite know how to read that. Looking back on it, I'm going to honor that I said a seven, but I don't want to scare anyone. I don't want to be like, oh my gosh, you're going to wake up in so much pain. So I tell her seven, I pass out again. I don't know what happened next for a while. Apparently, I kind of have carried on conversations according to all the people around me, the nurses and, and my parents. I don't remember doing that. I remember being out for a good chunk of time and feeling like I was out for a good chunk of time. And then the next time I woke up, the nurse was already talking to my parents. She was already in there. So I I think it was kind of like I realized there was another voice and woke up. And, you know, she, how are you doing now? And I said, I'm feeling better than earlier because I was. And she said, you know, you woke up thrashing from the anesthesia and I had to go call for help. And we had to get two or three people in here to hold you down. This is what I mean when I say I wake up terrible from anesthesia. I wake up fighting. So you know how there's that fight or flight? Apparently, I am all in. Fight me, bro. Which I can't do because I can't even, like, stand up because I'm so drugged out. But apparently I woke up, like, thrashing and trying to get off the bed. And, like, I lashed out at her a little bit. She didn't quite use those words, but I could kind of tell. And I had done that with my wisdom teeth as well, so it didn't surprise me. So... She said, you know, we we calmed you down, we got you resettled, that's why I was in the fetal position, because that's the only way they could get me settled, and they went and grabbed the doctor. He hadn't gone into his neck surgery yet, They thank God they were still prepping the OR, so he came out, he took a look at me, I hadn't pulled anything, I hadn't reopened anything, they didn't need to take me back into the OR, because she was really worried I had done that, and I, I'm so thankful that that is not how it ended, um, because it would have really, really sucked to to have to go back into the OR just as I was starting to wake up and do everything again. So she had that conversation with me. I laid awake for a little bit this time. I, I didn't immediately go out of conscious again. And then I asked if I could go to the bathroom. And so she was like, definitely, but we're going to make you walk for it. Like, we need to start getting you away. So she helped me stand up. And then my mom came under one arm. And I I say under, it's not like I wrapped my arms around them because I couldn't lift my arms, but kind of like they each took an elbow. Like I was, like I was an elderly woman who needed to cross the street is all I can compare it to. The nurse took one elbow, my mom took the other, and walking needs to be in quotes. I feel like I was more dragged towards the bathroom because I couldn't manage my feet. If you are of age or above age and, and you've ever been very, very drunk, like, to where the room is moving drunk, that's what it felt like. As I was coming out of anesthesia, I felt like I was completely trashed, and the world was moving, and I wasn't stable, and so we got into the bathroom, and the nurse was like, I can come in with you, that's no problem, you can try it on your own. I mean, the bathroom is not big at all, so I was like, let me try. I used the handicap bars to help stabilize me and was able to go to the bathroom. And when I came back, I just wanted to go back into bed. And the nurse and my parents were like, nope, we're going to work on keeping you awake, so you've got to go into the recliner, because your post-op area has a bed and a recliner and some cabinets. They settled me into the recliner and asked if I wanted anything. And my parents had brought some snacks and some ginger ale and some other stuff just for, for themselves, but also knowing that I might need them. And by this point, I was starting to feel a little bit nauseous, so I asked for some ginger ale. And they wanted, the nurse wanted me to get dressed, and so she headed off to take care of something else, and my parents helped me get dressed, which also should be in air quotes. My big advice to you is to, to wear a button-up shirt that morning, so you can just button it back on, so that's what I had done. I had an old dress shirt that didn't fit my father anymore, so we put that on because if it got blood stained or if it got ruined, no one really cared about this shirt. So I had a button-up shirt, and then I had worn leggings. And in hindsight, 
pajama pants would probably be a little bit better. I'm more comfortable in leggings, but it was very awkward to have people trying to help me get into leggings. So loose fitting clothing to help so people can help you get dressed. So I'm dressed, I'm in the chair, I've got some ginger ale, I've got some snacks, and the nurse came in and, and she offered me some pain meds because it was getting close to time for them, and, you know, I'd said that seven early, and so she was really worried about me, and I refused them because my stomach was just totally unsettled, and and it wasn't settling well, and I have digestive issues as well. I think I've mentioned before I have IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, so pain medicine and I, any medicine and I, are not a good combination because my stomach is just like, oh my god, I hate you, and I'm going to show you by making you violently ill. So at this point, we've been, I've been awake for a while, for a good chunk of time, and you know, the nurse is like, well, you're welcome to stay here as long as you want, but truthfully, getting home is going to be the best thing for you because then you can go to bed or you can lay on your couch or you can just get yourself comfy. And, and that's really going to make the biggest difference for you settling in and settling into your healing process. And at the time, I was like, yeah, you just want me out so you can have this room, which was not true. They had plenty of other space. But it's kind of, like, it's kind of what felt like to me because my PTSD still wasn't done. I mean, it never will be done, that's PTSD. But the whole event, it hadn't, it hadn't processed and I hadn't reached my normal state of I am not currently triggered. So to me, it felt like they were trying to kick me out a little, and it, and it raised my hackles a bit. But she was right. I Getting home was the best thing. So the nurse and my mother helped me get to the car, and, and they had a fantastic little spot to pick people up. Because I did this at an outpatient place. It wasn't at a hospital, but they kind of had, like, the drive-up bay where the car is right beside the door. So they get me into the front seat, and we had brought a big pillow to put in between me and the seatbelt if I wanted, but I ended up just tucking the upper strap behind me, so it, so I was buckled across my lap, and I did hug the pillow to my stomach and, and breast area because I didn't want anything to move because moving did not feel comfortable at that point. And then I asked my dad to drive slow because my dad has a slight lead foot that I've inherited. I fully cop to that too. But I, I remember looking at my dad and being like, please drive slow. And he's like, cause you're in pain. And I said, no, cause I don't want to vomit on mom's car. And that's all I remember. I don't like, I helped him get to the interstate because I knew this area better than he did. And then I don't, I don't remember the rest of the car ride. So I, I passed out again and slept the whole way home. But thankfully, you know, I, I didn't vomit in mom's car. So I ended up getting home around 1230-ish, and finally were, felt good enough to eat some crackers, had some more ginger ale, took my pain meds, and then, funnily enough, got stuck in my couch. So before all this happened, I had purchased a new couch that ended up getting delivered like the day before surgery, just due to weather and stuff. So it's a sectional couch. I, I just have to tell you this story because it's hilarious to me. It's a sectional couch, so the pieces slide together, but I have hardwood floors, and so in I settled into the corner, and I was like, this is going to be so comfy, This I'm just going to pass out on the couch all day, it will be great, and I laid down, and I was slightly propped up, and I wiggled to get just right, and as I wiggled, I shoved one section away from the other section, and my butt got stuck down in between them, and... I, both of my parents were in my kitchen, so they weren't in the living room as I'm doing this. I literally, like, I couldn't move because I couldn't use my arms to lift my body. That was one of the post-op things. So I was stuck in my couch, and, like, I'm still kind of drowsy and groggy from the meds, and I didn't fully understand what was going on. And so I was like, help? Like, I, I wasn't loud about needing help. I, I didn't call for help. I was just kind of like, I'm stuck. And my parents come walking out, and they're like, what? And my father's like, you're really stuck in the couch? And, and I, I was. I was stuck in the couch. So then I decided to go to bed and um, sleep in my bed <laughs> because it was safer and I wasn't going to get stuck in it. I slept for a couple hours. I think I only slept till like, 2.30. I didn't sleep a whole big chunk.
drunk, and then I was hungry, so I, I came downstairs, and my parents were both very surprised that I was awake that quickly, and I had something to eat, and laid down on the couch in a safer spot where there wasn't a section, and promptly passed out again, and I spent most of that night and the next day choosing something on Netflix, but never actually watching anything on Netflix, because I was just very drowsy, very out of it. Thank goodness my mom was staying with me, because she handled the pain meds every so many hours, because I had the prescription pain meds, but also you can take, or they want you to take in the first few days at least, 800 milligrams of Tylenol every three, every eight hours. So I was balancing these two and they didn't always line up. And so my mom was very good the first couple days and then we just set phone alarms for the rest of it to remember to take it. But day two was spent on my couch or in my bed, taking naps, watching Netflix, listening to music. I, I don't feel like I existed much during those days. I feel like I just, didn't really, you know, have consciousness a lot. Didn't, I wasn't awake. I wasn't involved in the world. You know, I was just, it was sleep and pain meds and eat and sleep and pain meds and eat. Or I guess more accurately, sleep, eat, and then pain meds so I wasn't nauseous again. So day one and day two were just, you know, trying to wake up from all of this and, and trying to get enough sleep for my body to heal. But I think that's where I'm going to stop because day three is the first shift out of that. Um, so next time I will cover day three and day four and what those were like. They had some highs and some lows that I think will be pretty interesting. And I just want to thank you again for taking the time to listen to my journey through uh, breast reduction. And I want to remind anyone who is listening that this is not a cosmetic surgery. I know it is billed as a cosmetic surgery, typically, but um, this is a life-changing surgery. This is a surgery for people who are in extreme pain, who feel trapped in their bodies because they can't do a lot. They are suffering. I know I was. I've I've given up a lot. This surgery is literally life-changing. And I I hope that through this journey and this process that you can see that and you can help me spread that message because so many of us have this surgery and, and get such negative reactions. But I also want to reach out to the people who are considering this and let you know that if you need someone to talk to about this who will not be judgmental, even if you're on the fence and you're not really sold on it, you are always welcome to reach out to me. I'm on Twitter at Road to Reduction. I have Road to Reduction podcast at gmail.com. There's the WordPress blog. There's a ton of ways to reach me, and please don't hesitate if you just have questions or just want someone to listen or someone to bounce ideas off of or people are having negative reactions to you sharing this decision. I'm, I'm here, and I'm a support for you, and the biggest thing you can do is find the supports in your life. So once again, thank you for listening. I'm Ashley. One year ago, I had a breast reduction, and thank you for joining me on my road to reduction. Music is Like Music, CDK Mix by CDK, copyright 2013. It's licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license.